I am Sarah Verhulst. I am with uh, Ghent University, and today I'll be talking about personalized and neural network-based closed-loop systems for augmented uh, hearing. Uh, the research I'm going to be talking about um, has developed over the past couple of years uh, in, a, in several research projects, and the people who have uh, mainly contributed to the work I'm going to show today uh, are shown here on uh, the pictures, you might see them uh, at one of the future conferences uh, if you want to ask them more detailed questions about uh, any of the work that's in my talk today. Uh, so if we think about uh, current challenges for hearing technologies, um, then over the past uh, couple of years, we've come to realize that sensory neural hearing impairment uh, has more aspects uh, than we used to know. Classically, we know for many years that there is other hair cell loss uh, associated with wider auditory filters and uh, a loss of uh, gain. Um, and traditionally, we treat that kind of hearing loss um, using hearing aids. Uh, but since uh, 2009, we also know that the synapses uh, that connect um, from the inner hair cells to the auditory nerve um, can lose uh, in numbers um, when we are aging or because of noise exposure, um, which means that we have fewer independent coding, coding channels when we have cochlear synaptopathy, which is uh, the name uh, of the hearing deficits when we lose uh, synapses between the inner hair cells and the auditory nerve. Um, and this uh, synaptopathy has so far uh, not uh, been incorporated within uh, clinical hearing diagnostics uh, because it's not visible in a standard audiogram uh, because it doesn't affect our near threshold coding. It only affects our supra threshold coding of sound. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's a type of hearing deficit that might be affecting uh, a broad uh, audience of, of older and older aging uh, people. Uh, and therefore should be both uh, diagnosed, um, but also incorporated within the next uh, generation of hearing technologies uh, so that we can uh, diagnose and treat all aspects uh, that relate to sensory neural hearing impairment. Now, uh, when we look at um, how we currently um, or how we should uh, change our hearing technologies uh, to incorporate uh, compensation for uh, cochlear synaptopathy. We can have a look at how speech um, is affected uh, by um, both combinations of synaptopathy and other hair cell deficits. So in the figure here, you see a small uh, part of speech, how this is filtered in different uh, frequency channels uh, and how uh, the features look like after this filtering. You see a few arrows here that show how, uh, like a, a number of prominent uh, speech features um, in the normal hearing system that may help us understand speech. One is here the peaks, one are here uh, the formants. Um, and after a hearing impairment, uh, these um, features will change. So if you look at this uh, hearing impaired listener, here is one with a combination of high frequency sloping audiograms with other hair cell loss and a 50% cochlear synaptopathy. Uh, we can see that, uh, for example, these onsets are reduced here. We have lower overall formant energy and here things are in fact rather uh, complicated as well. So it's not very straightforward to see how the functionality of these different types of sensory neural hearing deficits affect uh, speech coding. And therefore, it's not easy uh, to use our standard approaches to compensate uh, for people who have uh, combinations of these hearing deficits present. Um, so this is uh, requiring non-trivial auditory signal processing for the newest type of hearing technologies. Um, and if we look at where uh, this should be embedded within the framework of a very standard classical uh, hearing aid signal processing uh, device, we can see that uh, here is the part where uh, the magic should happen involving some sort of amplification for other hair cell loss, but other type of um, sound modifications for synaptopathy. 
Now, uh, solving this and figuring out what is a good hearing aid algorithm that compensates for both of these uh, sensory neural hearing aspects is difficult. Um, but it also, uh, we have some opportunities uh, with the latest research to start tackling uh, this problem. So first of all, um, when we look at uh, normal hearing and hearing impaired uh, we, uh, speech processing, we can use, in fact, auditory models uh, to predict uh, what speech looks like uh, for different types of hearing deficits. So the figure shows here an example where we take uh, some speech, we put it uh, through a precise uh, model of auditory signal processing, and out comes some uh, speech representation um, inside uh, our brainstem. Now we can use another precise model of auditory processing, but make it hearing impaired uh, by changing the functionality of the parameters of the model in such a way that it simulates how outer hair cell loss affects uh, cochlear uh, processing and how synapse loss affects um, auditory signal transmission. And using these aspects combined in here, we can have a simulated view of how hearing impairment uh, would affect speech in the brainstem. So these computational methods, uh, they have uh, existed for many years. Uh, yet uh, people fear sometimes the use of uh, biophysical computational models uh, inside uh, their studies of hearing impairment or the making of hearing aid algorithms because they are uh, rather complex uh, models. They take a high computational load on your computer um, and therefore it's not easy or linear um, to use them. But in any way, they would give us to this date, the most precise view of how uh, different aspects of sensory neural hearing loss affects our speech coding inside the brainstem. Um, using these type of models, we can also start thinking of numerical approaches uh, that go beyond uh, standard hearing aid algorithms to develop new algorithms uh, for hearing aids that can be used or hearing technologies that can be used to modify the speech characteristics before they are incoming uh, to make sure or ensure that the different signal between the normal hearing speech in the brainstem and that of the hearing impaired uh, speech in the brainstem is minimized. Now, again, uh, this type of approach um, has been used uh, for several, yeah, maybe several decades by now, um, but it's, it's slightly suboptimal. Uh, and the reason for that uh, has to do with that um, we just simply cannot backwards compute or reverse engineer these complicated nonlinear models. And so we don't have a full uh, perfect closed loop system in a numerical uh, way uh, available at this moment. Uh, so we would first have heavy computations and simulations and can only use the latter part here to actually optimize the hearing aid uh, algorithm. Whereas if you would have a fully differentiable uh, solution of your auditory model to begin with, then you can back propagate through the whole network uh, to come up with your perfect uh, engineered solution. Um, but we're not uh, there yet. Um, the requirements indeed uh, mean that um, we need uh, both uh, precision hearing diagnostics to make advances for the hearing technologies, as well as uh, come up with better computational methods uh, for our auditory models uh, that are inside the loop. Uh, when I talk about precision hearing diagnostics to this date, there is really no uh, clinical diagnostic test uh, on the market or in the clinics um, that can uh, quantify uh, cochlear uh, synaptopathy uh, with uh, humans in a clinical context, but we need this test because, of course, this model will only be uh, as precise as the parameters that we put in uh, to it. Um, so we first need precision hearing diagnostics and get a frequency-specific idea of the degree of uh, outer hair cell loss and the degree of cochlear synaptopathy. And once we have good personalized hearing impaired models, then uh, we can close the loop and make uh, new algorithms. Again, uh, the diagnosis uh, should be fast if we want it in the future to become part of a clinical routine. 
Um, secondly, I was talking about uh, the need uh, of these uh, precision models, uh, but that are slow to compute. Uh, and therefore, we can replace uh, these complicated auditory models here with DNN-based uh, approximations uh, of these biophysical models, uh, because uh, if we use neural network equations uh, to approximate or represent these auditory models, we can actually close the loop entirely and do a full backpropagation uh, for reverse engineering. Um, plus, um, if we use DNN-based methods, uh, the computations of the models themselves uh, will go faster. Uh, and the solution that I will show you a little bit later on in the talk, uh, we achieved an over 2,000 uh, speed up of basic auditory model uh, computation over the state of the art uh, regular um, analytical computational models um, that we have been using so far. Uh, again, DNN-based methods can be implemented uh, more easily in embedded systems because the equations that underlie it are easy to parallelize uh, and put in embedded systems. So this gives us also promise uh, for embedded uh, hearing aids in the future. Okay, DNN-based hearing aids, of course, um, they still need to uh, target latencies uh, of less than 10 milliseconds if we ever want to incorporate them inside an actual device. Um, and the benefit of DNN-based is that we can also do end-to-end -end, uh, audio processing and don't necessarily need to start with filtering into filter banks and applying gain or signal modification in each band and then recombine everything again. DNN-based methods allow us to go from audio to modified audio with the network without prior assumptions of any of the in-between uh, steps. So let me begin uh, with um, introducing you some possible solutions uh, for precision hearing diagnostics based on evoked potentials and trained uh, neural networks. Uh, afterwards, I'll talk about convolutional uh, auditory networks, like how do we uh, go from our complicated uh, biophysical models to neural network-based approximations. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about these DNN-based end-to-end algorithms for augmented hearing uh, that we can use for the next generation of hearing aids. So precision hearing diagnostics. Um, I am now basically uh, taking the tiny uh, computational model that I hit, had inside the block and uh, expand it uh, to becoming a full uh, computational auditory model of the signal processing uh, inside the cochlea, uh, shown here by the transmission line model, but uh, also using a Hodgkin-Huxley type uh, of inner hair cell model um, and auditory nerve synapse model. So if you look at the hearing loss uh, parameters, then we have to introduce cochlear gain loss by um, approximating or setting 1001 gain parameters or the poles of the basilar membrane uh, admittance. And when we want to introduce cochlear synaptopathy, we would have to set again frequency specific parameters of the degree and the types of auditory nerve fibers that are lost in an individual. Uh, this model goes further on and uh, basically uh, sums up all information across CFs and channels to give us an idea of what uh, a brainstem representation of sound would be in either the normal or the hearing impaired uh, system. So how do we... Um, how can we uh, find 1,000 uh, gain parameters for our model uh, based on a very few number of uh, actual uh, measurements? Well, um, the idea of doing this uh, was by using the distortion product autoacoustic emissions that can also be simulated by the model and by using a full numerical approach. So basically what you can do uh, simulation-wise is take uh, many different uh, types of cochlear gain loss and many different possibilities. And for each one of these possibilities, uh, calculate the distortion product autoacoustic emission changes that you see uh, as a function of um, this hearing loss uh, for different uh, frequencies of um, yeah, hearing impairment along the cochlea. 
Um, and then uh, we actually figured out that if you have uh, four DPOE uh, thresholds measured from a human, uh, we can train a neural network that actually extrapolates this data via the auditory model simulations to the parameters that we need uh, for the poles of the basilar membrane admittance. So basically from four uh, distortion product autoacoustic emission thresholds, we can uh, figure out uh, what uh, frequency specific gain function you need to implement here in your transmission line uh, model. Um, experimentally, uh, what this requires is at four frequencies to measure distortion product autoacoustic emissions at different levels and estimate this threshold. Uh, this is not the shortest uh, diagnostic procedure, uh, so we have afterwards checked uh, this type of uh, mapping of uh, measured thresholds to the parameters of um, the cochlear gain loss uh, by either using a low-level DP gram, uh, just low uh, levels and 11 frequencies, or by actually using the standard uh, audiometric frequencies to set these parameters. So here's a way in which we can use the computational uh, methods uh, to simulate how basically cochlear gain loss parameters relate to changes in distortion product uh, autoacoustic emissions to then afterwards using a few number of measurement data to be able to map for each individual their uh, poll functions that we can then introduce in their uh, tailored or personalized auditory model. Um, so similar to this, after having set uh, the individualized cochlear gain loss parameters, we still need to determine uh, somebody's um, synaptopathy parameters uh, for um, the different um, center frequencies there are in the human hearing. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, in our lab, uh, we've um, developed a test um, that relates uh, to cochlear synaptopathy by using an envelope following response marker. So what do we do in this test? Well, we send an amplitude modulated uh, pure tone to the ear. Uh, here, the modulation frequency is 120 hertz and our modulator is rectangular. Uh, what we then measure using standard EEG uh, electrodes is the envelope following response, which has a peak at 120 hertz and its higher harmonics. And the strength of this peak over the noise floor is um, resembling how well the auditory nerve fibers or the population of it can phase lock uh, to this uh, envelope. So the greater the response is, uh, the more synapses you have available, the lower the response is, the fewer uh, you have available. Now, this method uh, using amplitude modulation that is sinusoidal has been shown in research animals to actually be a proxy of cochlear synaptopathy. Now, we refined the methods uh, in our lab a bit by taking a rectangular uh, envelope. Uh, and so we verified together with uh, the lab of Ken Henry uh, that indeed uh, this marker is also sensitive to synaptopathy. So if you compare a standard envelope following response amplitude uh, to a sinusoidal amplitude modulation and that to a rectangular amplitude modulation, you can see in two uh, research animals, uh, the same research animals, uh, in fact, that the response uh, of this EFR peak is actually greater when we use uh, the rectangular uh, envelope. So that's a good thing because the greater the envelope is, the more precision that we will gain um, in the end uh, to try to dissociate responses from individuals. And then secondly, when uh, clinic ad, uh, acid is administered uh, to create an autotoxic uh, cochlear synaptopathy in the animals, you can see that the response is uh, greatly reduced uh, meaning that the marker is in fact uh, sensitive to cochlear synaptopathy. So uh, we think that this is a good marker to give us a non-invasive uh, proxy of cochlear synaptopathy. And we can again uh, simulate this response uh, inside our uh, auditory model. So we can use the same way of setting the cochlear gain parameters, but now uh, the cochlear synaptopathy parameters. 
by uh, presenting the same uh, stimulus here and by simulating uh, the envelope following response for different types of synapse patterns. So in uh, the work here uh, by uh, Sarini uh, Kashishadi, uh, we actually did these simulations only on the basis of six um, cochlear synaptopathy patterns um, so that we were classifying the um, based on a recorded EFR amplitude, we could classify uh, the uh, pattern that we needed to fit in here to being uh, one of these six high frequency sloping synaptopathy uh, patterns. So we again use this simulation approach here where you can see that the different colors of the theoretical response relate to these different synaptopathy patterns. And then afterwards, we do a measurement uh, with someone and we see uh, where their response lies uh, on this curve to then pick uh, the synaptopathy pattern that fits in them and uh, introduce it here. Uh, the test that we used uh, for it uh, at the moment takes 7 to 15 minutes, and we need uh, the combination of these um, cochlear gain loss parameter settings as well as this test together to actually come up with somebody's personalized <laughs> uh, auditory model. So then uh, we use auditory physiology and standard audiology practices to make a precise model of auditory signal processing that is hearing impaired uh, both in uh, uh, auditory nerve fiber damage or synaptopathy as well as on outer hair cell loss uh, based on a few number of physiological metrics and a pre-trained uh, neural network. So now we have a very accurate um, idea of how your hearing uh, works and how your signal processing is modified uh, after the hearing impairment. Um, so now we want to uh, paste basically your uh, hearing impaired model next to a standard normal hearing model to build our, um, you know, our new type of hearing aid uh, algorithms. Uh, but of course, we cannot do that just yet because we had a very biophysically precise uh, auditory model for you, and we don't have a computationally efficient uh, network here yet that can be back propagated through. So this brings us uh, to the second part of this talk, where I'm going to show you some examples of how we take these complicated biophysical models of auditory processing and cast them into a convolutional neural network approximation of that same model that has the exact same characteristics as the original uh, model. So I call these models uh, CONEAR because they're based on convolutional uh, neural networks. And uh, what is the method uh, by which we uh, determine the parameters of these uh, convolutional neural network based models uh, is as follows. So let's take our model and unpack it a little bit into a neural network uh, modeler system. Uh, we decided to still take, um, let's say, modules into these networks that corresponded to biophysical um, aspects in the auditory system. So we don't go from one uh, response to an outcome, we actually make sure that also in our neural network architecture, we can write out the response at different stages to both uh, simulate basal membrane vibration, the inner hair cell potential at all the CFs, as well as the auditory nerve response. Because this becomes important, of course, later on when we try to minimize uh, some sort of processing to make um, a hearing aid algorithm, then we also need to um, be able to ensure that we can um, take a loss function that focus on basilar membrane vibration and another one uh, that focus on other um, auditory nerve uh, fiber damage. So in essence, uh, Conier is in unpacked into different modules. Uh, and we have several papers that describes uh, why exactly we need so many layers, why exactly we need skip connections, uh, and uh, what type of nonlinearity we need to introduce. So I'm just going to highlight a few features here, but there's, of course, many more uh, descriptions inside the publications. 
So basically, when you take our standard biophysical analytical model, uh, uh, the old standard, which was a transmission line model, a Hodgkin-Huxley model for the inner hair cell and a three-store diffusion model for the auditory nerve synapse, we basically took a very big, large uh, speech data set and then um, simulated many basal membrane uh, vibrations for all of this and used uh, these vibrations or these simulated vibrations as the training data set because now we can create a lots and lots of data to be able to train the parameters of the neural network uh, approximation. And we did this for the three stages uh, separately. And uh, as just an example for uh, the other hair cell um, or the transmission line model, uh, we can see that we minimized this loss. Uh, so we uh, changed the parameters until uh, the neural network simulated responses resembled those of uh, the traditional transmission line model well. Um, afterwards, to see whether this worked, uh, because we want to have a model that's equivalent to a cochlear mechanical transmission line model, uh, we used stimuli that it didn't see during the training phase to see whether it also creates uh, the responses to standard basic uh, um, cochlear mechanic experiments. So for example, you can see that uh, with the 10H nonlinearity that we put between the layers, that we pretty much mimic very well uh, the wider uh, filters with level uh, and the sharp uh, tuning uh, that we had here in the reference transmission line model. But that if, for example, we would take another nonlinearity, uh, that we wouldn't be able to match this feature at all. So it is sort of precision engineering. It's not just any neural network. Uh, that will help you, uh, that will give you realistic parameters. Uh, but we took a few steps or an iterative approach uh, to basically figure out what the features needed to be uh, of the model. Secondly, I'm showing you here the tuning across CF of the trained uh, model. So these are QERB functions across CF. Uh, we can see in the black dots the, the reference transmission line model uh, cochlear filter tuning, and then we can see of our neural network, our trained neural network, that also the tuning matches uh, pretty much uh, the target. So we can conclude with these uh, that we have a good uh, approximation of the cochlear transmission line model uh, using a completely different uh, neural network uh, architecture for the computations. Uh, we did the same for the auditory nerve uh, fibers, um, just to show you a quick example here. Uh, here we basically looked at uh, the auditory nerve uh, firing patterns at 1 and 4 kilohertz for different spontaneous rate fibers. And when you compare the two columns to each other, you can basically see that our Conier version of the auditory nerve model matches very well um, the original target. So again, here we can be confident that our neural network implementation is a good model uh, for this. So basically, we have uh, all the elements uh, in each part ready. We used analytical models to generate a big training data set that we used to set and determine and optimize the parameters and the architectures of these neural network approximations. And now we have a full backpropagation model ready uh, for uh, the whole system. So let's go back here and now uh, look at the DNN-based end-to-end uh, algorithms. Now we take basically a normal hearing model and we use transfer learning to generate a hearing impaired model uh, based on uh, our biophysical hearing impaired uh, models that we had earlier. Um, so we set uh, the parameters based on our physiology physiology measurements, and now can uh, use the different signal between these two, including a loss function, to train a whole new neural network using the same uh, CNN architecture, which is called our DNN uh, hearing aids, uh, to basically compensate for the hearing impairment and ensuring that here the loss function is uh, minimized between the two responses. Now, of course, you have still uh, a, a few ways uh, to play around with the loss function. You can make it focus on other hair cell loss alone, on synaptopathy alone, 
on combinations of the both on only uh, focusing on, on, on high frequency loss or not. So you, you can still play around with these uh, loss functions a little bit, uh, but I'm gonna show you some examples uh, later. So in essence, uh, after we trained our DNN hearing aid uh, in our very first uh, approach of this, we end up with a DNN hearing aid that has 6 million parameters and that can run any multitude of 265 samples of input after training in real time and on a computer. So it's really an end-to-end -end, uh, system that can run in real time on a computer, not yet a hearing aid. So if I'm gonna show you what it focuses on uh, in the next slide, I'm going to give you an example of, uh, because we didn't precondition this, this, this hearing aid algorithm to focus on anything specific other than to minimize the loss functions. So it's not clear what it really did to reach its solution. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a little example here um, of what it does to a speech segment. So here we have um, a hearing loss that is basically a sloping high frequency hearing loss. We asked uh, the DNNHA model to actually compensate for that hearing loss um, uh, there where I put the loss function. And so in black, you see a speech uh, waveform, that's the unprocessed sound. And then um, you see um, that's the normal hearing, and then you see the hearing impaired unprocessed uh, in red. So after any processing, uh, the these functions should lie closer uh, to the black line uh, on top. So you can see the processing uh, in blue with our algorithm and a specific loss function. And you can see the comparison uh, with an LRP or the PLAC uh, standard processing functions. They are slightly different. They focus on slightly different things, but the difference is really that we didn't precondition it uh, in any kind of way. It's a full uh, neural network optimized uh, solution that we generated. If we look at the error that uh, we simulate with our new method, uh, then you can see the difference uh, unprocessed uh, and processed uh, with our method. Unprocessed is just uh, the hearing impaired uh, model. So the lower this error is to zero, the better it is. So you can see that with our neural loss, uh, yeah, DNM based hearing aid, we have lower loss functions, a uh, lower errors for different stimulus levels, whereas the errors in these uh, other two models are actually greater. So our method, even though it can also be used for cochlear synaptopathy, it can also be set in, uh, in parallel to existing regular uh, outer hair cell based uh, hearing aid uh, methods. So this is promising. Uh, secondly, when we only uh, made an algorithm for the compensation of cochlear synaptopathy, uh, you can. There are no other algorithms uh, available for from the hearing aid industry in this case. Uh, but we just show uh, what these algorithms do to the speech waveform uh, for the unprocessed against uh, yeah one where there is uh, synaptopathy. So red versus black is our normal hearing versus hearing impaired. And then we see for two processing schemes uh, that it uh, yeah, does a few things, but it never really fully manages to restore uh, what is lost in this case. And this is also seen in the error function. We actually see that our processing doesn't bring this error function uh, down by a lot, which is also given by the thought that in synaptopathy, you just lose a lot of fibers and it's not, um, you know, you can only tr uh, increase uh, slightly um, optimal coding, but you can never fully replace uh, that you've lost, for example, 50% of your uh, nerve fibers. But again, uh, we think that uh, in the combinations of um, outer hair cell loss compensation, as well as synaptopathy compensation and a more individualized approach, we will in fact um, gain a benefit over existing uh, devices that do not compensate at all um, for synaptopathy. So lastly, I'm showing you uh, an audio example of the NAL RP and our own uh, algorithm in terms of sound quality. 
Uh, as you can see on the figure, uh, we have an unprocessed uh, hearing impaired uh, sentence response on the basilar membrane. Um, this is our normal hearing target in black, and this is uh, the processed result with both type of um, hearing aid algorithms. So both perform pretty well at frequency specifically uh, compensating for um, the outer hair cell loss. And in terms of sound quality, also the approaches are comparable. So let's listen to the NEL RP and then afterwards our DNN uh, based hearing aid um, for you to examine sound quality. Second twitched his shirt sleeve and he felt a brief burn on his upper arm. A second twitched his shirt sleeve and he felt a brief burn on his upper arm. So you hear small uh, differences between them, but I think we can agree that sound quality uh, in the two algorithms is actually quite comparable. And this is promising when we take these methods uh, towards our next experimental studies, where we will look at speech intelligibility benefit uh, for hearing impaired listeners with or without uh, synaptopathy. Uh, so even though the DNN hearing aid algorithms use a completely different approach than the standard uh, signal processing methods, uh, I hope you agree after this talk that they are a very promising next avenue uh, for uh, the hearing technologies that uh, we will be developing in the next years that both include uh, precision hearing diagnostic advances as well as um, advances in computational uh, auditory modeling methods to then come up with a new uh, type of DNN-based uh, hearing aid algorithms that can be easily implemented in DNN uh, chips and hopefully um, the next generation of embedded systems for hearing aids and hearing technologies. And with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I'm always open uh, to questions you might have uh, to this talk.